Hey guys, it's Maggie and I am back today and I'm very excited for today's video. I'm going to be talking about a subject that I have been looking into for quite some time now. I've been very interested in it and we're going to talk about short bowel syndrome and high output ostomies. <laughs> I really wanted to talk about high output on my channel um, when I started to experience symptoms of high output. I would not classify my ileostomy as high output, but the way that my stoma works definitely has changed over the last few months, the last couple years even, um, to where my output gets more watery and looser. Um, much more frequently and it's something that truly in the first 10 years or so of having my ostomy I, I didn't experience. Weirdly enough, even though when I had my proctocolectomy done, um, my colon and rectum had not been used in 10 years. They were just sitting in there kind of doing nothing, but I had them removed. Um, my ostomy was not changed whatsoever. It was still, I was still functioning off of the same GI organs that I had been for such a long time, but for whatever reason, my ostomy output just seemed to get looser after that surgery. So my surgeon and I kind of had to find ways to manage this. I also had a number of friends that dealt with symptoms of high output ostomy because of short bowel syndrome, which really those two do go hand in hand quite a bit. Um, I do not have short bowel syndrome and I'll explain that in a little bit, but it's something that is kind of common and I was hoping to make this video kind of trigger some questions for you, for your doctors, if you are experiencing any high output symptoms. Symptoms. And if you're watching this video on Wednesday, hopefully I can get it up in time. Um, it is my birthday, so I am officially 29, my last year of my 20s, and I hope that this video is a good kickoff to that. Some of you know that I worked a lot with ostomy patients, and um, that was in a nursing role. And I did a lot of research because I wanted to understand short bowel syndrome better. Um, I had had some experiences in my inpatient pediatric hospital, but those were limited. Those were limited um, just based on the population that I would see. It was more in the adult population that I later worked with that I saw a lot of the short bowel issues, which was high output, looser output, issues like that. I joined the WOCN Society, which is the Wound Ostomy Incontinence Nursing Society. Um, I actually worked conferences for um, companies, obviously outside companies not related to WOCN, um, but I would attend their conferences and there was one year, I believe that I was actually there, but I did not see this talk and I really, really wish I had in person, but thankfully it was recorded and I viewed it many times online from a dietitian nutritionist named Carol Reese Parrish, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, um, but she gave this amazing talk on high output ostomies and short bowel syndrome. She is just so knowledgeable. If you're part of WOCN, it's on there. It's on the continuing education courses. It's really incredible. She also has come out with a resource for patients, a free resource for patients. And uh, when I actually ordered it, it was just one book. This was a few years ago when I was really trying to learn about it for ostomy patients. But now it's two books. There's an adult version and a pediatric version. And it is a book that's mailed to your home for free. And it really goes in depth about short bowel syndrome and how to manage the symptoms of that, which is just, I really, I highly recommend it if you have short bowel or if you have high output. Um, what was contained in that really helped me with my own issues of just looser output, the annoyingness of that, um, getting dehydrated, things like that. She goes into the pathophysiology of it, how the small bowel um, works after all these resections, after all the intestine is removed. Um, she goes into dietary choices that are good for people that uh, have issues with that. I mean, it's just, it's really, really great. So I'm gonna put that in the description below, but know that my information a lot of it I learned from her, her book, incredible. She's also, I think she's got a nursing book or maybe it's not a nursing, but it's more of a 
um, medical related book about this and I kind of want to get it. <laughs> I kind of want it. <laughs> so um, yeah, anywho, from my understanding, and this might be different uh, depending on what source you're looking at, short bowel syndrome does not necessarily have a definition as to how much bowel you have left. It's more so the point at which you do not have enough bowel to absorb nutrition appropriately or adequately is a better word. When we look at all the different parts of the GI system, they all have a different job. Uh, we look at the small intestine, there is the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum. They all play a different part and within them, there are different parts that do different things, absorb different things. Then we have the colon and you may know that if you don't have a colon, um, its big job is to absorb fluid and electrolytes. And that's not to say that the colon is the only place that that can happen, but it's a major part. So when somebody like myself gets surgery, has their colon removed, and is only working with the small intestine, fluid and electrolytes is a huge issue. I've required IV fluids before when my colon obviously wasn't around to do the job I needed it to do. Um, so it's something that people have to think about. And when I talk in terms of short bowel and me not having it, I do just want to clarify. Um, so obviously, how many times do I have to say it? My colon and rectum are gone. We had those suckers taken out a long time ago. Not a long time ago. Two years ago. Feels like a long time ago. But I also did have part of my ileum taken out. I think that was 2009. I had about half of my terminal ileum removed. So the thing about the terminal ileum is it's the biggest point at which you can absorb B12. Um, and I always get comments when I say that, Maggie, get your B12 checked, get your B12 checked. You might be low, you might need to get B12 injections. And I have been very fortunate that apparently I have enough terminal ileum to absorb that because I've never been low. I've always been right where I need to be. So thankfully, I don't need that. But yes, I haven't had any more small intestine removed. Uh, knock on some wood. This isn't really wood, but shoot, somebody knock on wood for me because <laughs> I don't have any clothes. I'm hoping not to lose any more intestine. That's our hope. <laughs> I get asked that too. People are like, if you had surgery, why are you on Humira? And Humira is to prevent my small intestine from getting any disease because what I have left of my terminal ileum, which is what my stoma is made out of, um, has had Crohn's disease activity. And when I started Humira, that cleared up in, I think a couple of months, they did a scope and saw that it was gone. Anyways, depending on how much bowel you have left and how it kind of reacts to everything and how it adapts, can tell you what kind of therapies you might need in order to adequately get the nutrition you need and the fluids that you need. There are some people who can simply use diet and be able to manage their short bowel that way. Um, it can slow things down depending on what you eat and then there are certain foods and drinks that speed everything up and kind of flush out of you. Some people can also manage on different medications and I'm gonna talk just a little bit about that um, from my own personal experience because there is one medication that I use um, that helps me a lot. I think it's the most effective thing in my case. And then there are cases where patients unfortunately just can't get all of the nutrition and fluid that they need from their intestines that they have left. So they might require things like IV hydration. And I know a lot of people without short bowel syndrome that require this, that just have ostomies. Um, but I also do know people with short bowel that require fluids. And then in some cases, they might require something called TPN, total parenteral nutrition, which is just IV nutrition. And that's something that I've done in the past as well. It's just in my case, it was a temporary solution just to help get me over the hump of everything when I first got my ostomy surgery, which is why I have my little my little central line scar, that's what those little dots are. And then I have a pick line scar here too from a few years earlier. Um, but I just used it temporarily, whereas some people do need it for the rest of their lives. So there really are a number of ways to manage it. I think in this video, we're really gonna be talking a lot about the diet aspect of it. And I am gonna bring my own experience into it because that's, you know, I think that's the best way that I talk. But before that, I do just wanna talk about the bowel and how incredible. <laughs> I just think it's really neat because, you know, I've talked about 
when the colon is gone, you don't have that ability to absorb fluids and electrolytes like you did before. But what happens over time is your small bowel adapts. And the book that I talked about really goes into detail about how that works in the intestine. I think it's so cool. It also talks a little bit, I think about like biofeedback and how the mechanisms that kind of stop food from like going right through you um, can get a little messed up when you have surgery and how they can get better. It's just fascinating, it really is, but I don't feel educated enough to speak on it, so I'm not going to. I'm gonna let you, you know, find that research yourself. <laughs> I just don't wanna mess it up. I don't wanna mess it up, but it's just completely fascinating, and that's exactly what happened to me. I was on the TPN um, after my surgery, and prior to surgery, I could not gain weight. I think I was around 60-something pounds when I was in the hospital with my ostomy. Uh, brand new. And after I got the ostomy, it did not take long for me to start eating, eating whole foods, and my bowels start to slow down and then me begin to gain weight off of TPN. Didn't start like that. Things were pretty loose um, and watery and clearly I wasn't absorbing a whole lot of what I was taking in. I was still requiring fluids and stuff, but it just, it slowed down, and actually very quickly in my case. It's just really neat to think back to that time when I didn't really understand what was happening, and now I do. Um, but that was another point that Carol had made in one of her talks was that, you know, it's important to push whole foods rather than things like formulas because it encourages the small bowel to adapt and to do things that the colon used to do. I just think it's fascinating. I need to like, I definitely wanna read more into it so I can better be able to explain it. But um, like I said, I'll put those resources in the description so you guys can look at it too and order the book if you're interested. So like I had mentioned, in the last couple of years, um, especially in the last few months, I have experienced this kind of thinning out with my ostomy output. Um, I never remember having issues with watery output, having leaks because of watery output, um, feeling like I had to eat at certain times because of it, or anything like that. I never remember thinking about my ostomy output being weird. And then I slowly started to notice oh, you know what, I better I better eat some bread or something to slow, slow my intestines down because my ostomy is pouring out water. And I don't know if it had anything to do with that weird stomach problem I was having in the fall. Um, again, knock on some wood, I haven't had that in a few months, but it probably was related to that. And actually during one of the times when I had a really um, severe abdominal pain issue, I remember taking a few sips of water and not 10 minutes later seeing it come out in my bag. And it terrified me. I was like, I just drank that. Um, and there are times where I can see food that I ate within the last half hour come out of my stoma. And that's not normal for me. So I really had to look into what I could do because I know, you know, I've been struggling with my weight, not nearly as much as I had in the past, but I am not where I was a few years ago. Um, I typically weigh around 95 to 97 pounds and right now I am 89 to 90. Sometimes 91 on a good day. So I know that I have a little bit of weight loss but nothing insane. I do think it has to do somewhat with my ostomy output and just not quite absorbing the amount that I I used to. So something that I was prescribed by my surgeon right after my colectomy was loperamide or Imodium and it's a medication that I think I mentioned this in a recent video too that I really found I had to take consistently to work so right after my surgery I would take it really didn't notice an effect by it and I kind of gave up on it but in the last few months really realizing okay your output's watery and it you're having to empty your bag more than you usually would Let's try to get into a routine with this. And I learned that taking it about an hour before meals really helped. And I found that instead of taking two milligrams of it, I take four. Um, and mind you, this has all been prescribed. I was told to take two to four milligrams before meals. Um, but I really had to learn the regimen that worked best for myself. They said, take it half an hour before food. 
I found it more effective an hour before. And there are other medications that you can use as well. There are really interesting medications that are coming out, um, pills, injections, different things like that, that are helping with short bowel syndrome patients and high output ostomies. But this is the one that I probably know the most about and have personal experience with. A lot of people are put on loperamide after ostomy surgery. Um, obviously, this is something you should talk to your doctor about. I know that Imodium is available over the counter, but I have it as a prescription. Do not start any medications without talking to your doctor and getting the okay from them. But hopefully with this information in this video, you can go to them and say, hey, would this be a possibility for me or not? So yes, I got into the regimen of the loperamide and that really seemed to help things slow down which was huge. Um, I was having trouble, especially overnight, having to empty my ostomy bag frequently. And it actually got to a point where I ordered samples from Coloplast, I'll show you them in a second, of overnight bags, just to see if it was something that I thought I could use. They're clear. I never used them because I was like, oh, I, I don't like clear bags. I just don't like seeing my output all the time. But they're a good option in somebody who is having a lot of output, particularly overnight, and uh, not wanting to get out of bed every, you know, half an hour, hour to go and empty it. So the liparamide really cut down on that. And uh, the emptying overnight, I dealt a lot with, uh, with patients that had ostomies in the hospital. I had one patient that had an ostomy um, that really struggled with it, had very bad prolapses, had very little intestine, and um, the intestine that they did have did not function correctly. Um, so basically the output was water. Um, could not absorb a whole lot, was TPN dependent, um, could do a little bit of formula, but really not a whole lot else. And a huge problem was having to empty the bag overnight multiple times, having the bag leak, constantly it was it was a struggle and one of the solutions to that is an ostomy bag like this so this one is by coloplast i just ordered a sample and it is a much larger bag as you can see and it has a little nozzle end here and typically you see that with your ostomies because you know that the output is going to be thin um, but with something like an ileostomy that's high output, the output will have no trouble going through this. And there are actually attachments that can connect to the end of this bag. It has a tube and then it connects to a second bag that you can put on the floor. So that way you have a very large reservoir for output overnight. Um, for anybody who has a G-tube, if you've ever done a feral bag, very similar concept to that. Um, obviously this is just ostomy output and not stomach content output. <laughs> yes, this is one of the options for that. Thankfully, I did not need that and the loperamide cut down on my overnight um, emptying quite a bit. If I take it before bedtime, I usually don't have to empty until morning, which is fantastic. Before I move on to diet though, one other thing that helped me a lot was the gelling sachets. Sometimes, even if you don't have short bowel, you don't have high output, Sometimes you eat something that just doesn't agree with you. Sometimes you just feel a little funny and your output gets watery and thin. You might get a stomach bug. Um, I found that using the gelling sachets, amazing. I mean, it just, it makes it so your output's not all watery. When your output's watery, your flange tends to leak a bit more. <laughs> um, it feels like the enzymes are really just trying to burn your skin. And I actually had that the other night, so I had to get up and put one of the sachets in my bag. And it worked. It worked. It solidified the output so that way it wasn't trying to sneak around my stoma and get on my skin. But that's another option for you. Um, my favorite brand is from Trio, so I'll put that in the link below. But there are other brands as well. So anyway, let's move on to diet. And when I talk about diet, I'm really going to frame it in this is what I do. Um, I did get a lot of my information from Carol Reese Parrish's book. She really has a great list of good foods and bad foods for ostomies that are just a little bit of an overachiever, a little too active. So, And I found a lot of the foods that I gravitate towards fit right into the good foods and they're definitely the ones that make me feel better with an ostomy. And I, I, every time I mention diet, I do get a lot of comments about 
how terrible my diet is. Um, there are reasons that I eat the things that I do. They make me feel the best and that's just where I'm going to leave it there. Um, and you'll see that if you get the book, you'll see that a lot of what I eat kind of lines up with what is listed uh, is good for ostomies. Not everything, not everything. And there are some things that I found that I'm okay with that are not recommended for ostomies. So just keep that in mind. Everybody's different. Everybody works a little bit differently, um, but for the most part, I fall pretty much in line with her diet guide. She has helped people that were TPN dependent get off of TPN and be able to get their nutrition with medications and diet changes, which is just incredible. Um, I know that originally when I, like before we knew I had a stricture and I was on TPN through a pick line, um, I remember my dad and I sitting in the education room at my hospital and we were learning how to care for a pick line and we were so afraid. Um, and that's not to say that it's not doable. I see patients all the time, people with ports, people with pick lines, central lines, whatever, care for them at home. But when it's the first time that you never thought that you would be in that situation, I was so afraid that I would get an infection in my bloodstream. Um, and obviously I went on to work at that hospital and care for a whole lot of pick lines, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I'm good with them now. But at the time, obviously we didn't have that education and we were scared I had to go home with it. And thankfully I, I didn't wind up having to go home on it, but it's a wonderful option for people who need it. But it's also fantastic when you're able to go home and not have it. Let's talk about the things that I've done with my ostomy when it's just, you know, a little too watery, coming out a little too often. Probably the number one thing that I do is oral rehydration solutions. And there are a ton out there, but I have one that I really like in particular. And basically what this does is it helps me absorb water and electrolytes. It's about getting this fine balance of sugar and electrolytes in order to absorb the maximum amount in your intestines and not have it just kind of run through your intestines. It's the whole sodium transport system that I only half understand. <laughs> Learned it many times, but yes, it's this fine balance. And I found that for me personally, uh, using Noon, and that's spelled N-U-U-N, uh, those tablets I found to be the most effective and I like the taste the best because they're not overly sweet. I find with some oral rehydration solutions, they really try to hide the salty flavor. Uh, with sugar or some kind of sweetness and I just I do not have a sweet tooth at all I don't like the really sweet sugary drinks. So um, that's why I found the noon to be the best plus It's the most convenient little tablet that I throw into my water bottle and it fizzes and I certainly find throughout the year that there are different times when I require a lot of it and other times when I don't usually in the winter time I'm pretty okay unless it's very dry I, Zach and I fight about this one. I love humidity. Um, I don't like hot and humid, but I like, you know, a 70 degree day where it's really humid like yesterday. That was perfect for me. I don't get dehydrated then. I, I just, I do so much better. I feel so much better when I get dehydrated though. It's usually when it's very dry out and not humid. Um, so I will require a lot more rehydration solutions. So that typically happens either dead of winter, uh, but more so in the dead heat of summer. <laughs> I will require a lot of the noon. Uh, I'll be drinking two to three of them a day because you can feel it. You just don't feel good. You have a headache, you feel fuzzy, you feel ugh. And you can tell by your urine output based on the color of your urine. If it's very dark, then you are dehydrated. If it's lighter, you're probably more hydrated. So, you know, that's the time when my urine would get a little bit dark is when it's very, very dry out. So that's probably my number one thing with trying to combat this. Um, the other thing, and I, I do fail to do this, but it's something I should be doing, is eating multiple times a day uh, rather than eating large meals. I also find that kind of ordering my food, which I'll explain in a second, really helps with how I absorb everything. So if I eat something a little bit more bulky first thing in the morning, something like oatmeal, 
um, I will do a lot better throughout the day. So then if I have a smoothie around mid-morning, it doesn't just run right through me. It usually sticks with me a bit better and I get a little bit more out of it. Whereas if I just went straight to a smoothie on an empty stomach, that smoothie is out of me usually within an hour and a half. So I tend to do that. I kind of go back and forth. Um, certain things I know just go through me faster, like salmon. So I'll try and eat something either with it or before it that will slow things down. I'll do things like couscous or uh, mashed potatoes, something of that nature to kind of block it so I can absorb some of it. Another thing that I, I find kind of interesting that I've pretty much always done since having an ostomy and I didn't realize that I did this was avoiding sugar, especially like sugary drinks. Um, <laughs> I think that people find this funny with me. I actually don't, I haven't had any soda in a long time because my stomach just stopped being able to handle it and I don't know why. Um, but when I would drink something like Pepsi or Coke, I would always get diet. I always got diet soda of pretty much everything because if I just got regular Coke, regular Pepsi, I never felt good afterwards. I mean, if I got regular, I would, I would drink it, but I just didn't feel good afterwards. So I always tended to get the diet drinks, um, and I just assumed the sugar just didn't make me feel that great. So <laughs> it wound up making sense. Avoiding sugar is a huge one for me, mostly when it comes to uh, fluid, not so much with food. Something else that kind of just falls in line with the dehydration part of all of this. Um, I have mentioned before, I do not have a sweet tooth. There's probably a reason for that. I really like salty snacks. I could just go for days on them and that might have to do with this dehydration aspect. I'm trying to get more salt in me. So um, I do eat a lot of salty snacks and that seems to help me as well. If I am headachey, I will often eat something. Probably helps me pull more fluid in. Now I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail of certain foods that I find help slow me down. Um, and a lot of these are listed in the book. <laughs> Uh, they kind of match up with what helps people with high output ostomy slow down. And uh, not everybody is going to agree with these foods that I eat, but they just work for me. So I'm going to keep going with them. But stuff like breads really do. That's probably the number one thing I do really well with, especially white breads like naan. We've been eating a lot of naan bread lately. Um, that works extremely well. Another thing that I'm kind of excited because I can grow it is squash. I do really well with squash. So we've been doing stuff like acorn squash, um, butternut squash, and I'm growing delicata this year. Hopefully it actually grows <laughs> and I get some out of it, but stuff like that. I actually didn't eat a lot of squash before, but last year since we grew some, um, we started to cook it up and I got a little worried because I really hadn't eaten it a ton. I'm thinking, man, this is new to my stomach. It might not sit well, it might go through me. And I found the exact opposite to be true. I found that it slowed me down, which is exactly what I needed. You guys know that I love my French fries. So anything potato related also tends to be really good in my stomach. Um, usually if I am not feeling well, we get French fries. Um, I know, I know it's fast food, but it seems to work with me. It really does. It, it just, it's like a reset for my intestines, which has been fantastic because I absolutely love French fries. So, oh boo hoo, I gotta get more fries. That's another thing that I, I will rely on. There are a couple other things that I will avoid as well. Like, um, I don't eat a lot of meat to begin with. I'm pescatarian. I've been pescatarian for six to eight years. Something in that range. I don't really remember when I started. It was sometime in college. Um, so I only eat fish. But at that, like, fish is also something I do not absorb well. I don't eat sushi anymore because that just doesn't work with my ostomy. I can eat things like salmon, like I said, if I partner it with other foods that will help slow me down. Something I do not ever eat is fried meats fried fish. I, fish sticks? Oh, ugh, no. It's sort of funny that the stuff that my ostomy just hates, 
I have also come to hate, like the thought of it ugh, just makes me want to vomit. And I think it's because I know how I'm going to feel afterwards, which I think is kind of funny, but <laughs> it's funny how that works out. It's like my body is just telling me don't don't put yourself through that, please, please. And the other thing that I avoid, which I don't notice a ton of issues with, um, is dairy. I don't, that's the thing. When I say avoid, I'm not actively avoiding it. I just genuinely don't like dairy products. Um, but when I eat it, I'm okay. Um, sometimes I notice an increase in output, sometimes I don't. So I don't really know uh, how it affects me. I just know that I don't like it a lot. I don't like milk. I don't like yogurt. Not by itself. So I I'm not sitting over here drinking a whole thing of milk. Zach, on the other hand, is a different story. Um, he loves milk. So, but you will not catch me drinking a glass of milk. It's just not, not who I am as a person. But I've also made sauces like um, for tikka masala, I'll do a tomato-based sauce that has heavy cream in it. And with that, totally fine. No issues. Don't notice anything. Don't notice anything different. So it's sort of interesting how that works, but I've come to tailor my diet, especially over the last few months, to really work well with the medication I'm on to keep my ostomy output normal. I'm not perfect with it. Sometimes I make a mistake with my diet. Sometimes I miss my medication. So... Um, you know, it really is, it's a battle that you are just kind of constantly in. It's not something that I could fix, you know, go get a surgery and be totally normal again. I had that issue for a little while in the beginning with my ostomy, then my bowel adapted, and then I had some problems that we're not really sure why, I had some stomach issues that caused my output to be looser again. So it could go back and forth, and it's something that I just kind of have to constantly monitor, see how I'm doing day by day, and manage it as such. The book has, like I said, a lot of diet recommendations that I think true short bowel syndrome patients would find really useful. It just really helped me as well with, uh, you know, the high output issues that I've had every now and then. Again, not trying to say, you know, oh my gosh, my, my ostomy is terrible and it's super high output. It's not, it really is not, but I've noticed the output change and me have to actively manage that. Whereas in the past, I never noticed that to be the case. I feel thankful for the way that my stoma acts. We're cool with where we're at. We can manage this pretty easily compared to other people. But anyways, I feel like I've been talking for quite some time now. I hope that this video um, covers this topic. I, I, I really wanted to make a good video and I'm not sure that this is covering it how I want to or like giving enough education about it. But again, there are so many other um, people that are so much more educated on this, like the lady that I mentioned who just have great resources out there and um, I'm really sharing from my own experience, which is limited because I don't have short bowel um, and I don't have an extremely high output ostomy. But hopefully this is at least somewhat informative, you enjoyed it and yes, um, thank you so much for watching. I am going to go celebrate my 29th birthday and I will see you in the next. Bye guys.